All right. Well, I guess we'll get started. Um, big crowd. Just so everyone knows, this isn't a talk about artisanal internets. This is uh, not actually a talk about how it's great to work for Greg either. So we're going <laughs> to talk about running Cloud Foundry. If everyone's here for Cloud Foundry, that's what we're going to talk about. If you want to talk about artisanal internets, go see Dr. Nick. Um, so my name is Tim, and this is Neville. And we work for Comcast. And what we wanted to talk to you today about is uh, what our experience has been running with Cloud Foundry for the last couple of years. So if you were here with us last year, we had another talk, and we were talking about kind of the same thing, what it was like running Cloud Foundry back then. And uh, we didn't really have too much going on. We had a, a single foundation. We had a, a few orgs, a few apps, um, not too much traffic. And over the past year, it's definitely grown. So we've, we've seen a rapid growth in adoption. People love the platform. We have six foundations now across the country. We have a whole ton of orgs. And uh, we're running about 900 apps. And some of those are running uh, critical applications for us. They're, they're right within the critical path of uh, our customer interaction. So it's been a really big year. Um, and last year, when we were talking to folks, the biggest question that we got from them was what it was like to run Cloud Foundry. And to use an analogy sort of similar to what Greg was talking about in the keynote, it is like flying an airplane. So back then when we went on our journey, we were you know, taking that leap of faith and jumping off the airplane. Uh, and now we're flying the airplane. So we have this, this highly modern, fast airplane, which is Cloud Foundry, that gets our developers to where they're going faster than ever before, and more conveniently than ever before. And we get to be the pilots. So it's a good opportunity for us, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we feel fantastic you know, driving this. These are the best seats in the house. Um, we've been running it for a couple of years. And every time I walk in there to like, do my job, I feel like Iceman, you know, not, not to be, uh, um, I don't mean to offend the Maverick and Goose fans either. Uh, but frankly speaking, this is what our customers expect from us. But in all reality, at the end of the day, that's exactly how we feel. <laughs> we feel the, the cabin is hot, uh, we're sweating like that striker, and mm -hmm. we are ready to jump out of that airplane. On days like these, you can actually find Tim walking around without his shirt. <laughs> Why Tim? Well, not exactly without my shirt, but, but basically because we're, we're, we're faced with this, we're faced with... Um, a cockpit that, that can be a little overwhelming at first. And um, you know you have metrics upon metrics, metrics here, metrics there. Um, you have a lot of different management interfaces that um, control Cloud Foundry. We use Pivotal Cloud Foundry, so we're constantly going between Bosch and Ops Manager trying to figure out what, um, what's the best way of doing what. Uh, we have backups that we have to worry about, build pack maintenance, load balancing. Uh, and we're a full service shop, so we, we manage the infrastructure underneath. We're VMware engineers as well, and we manage the underlying physical <coughs> hardware. So it can be a lot sometimes. And uh, also, can't forget about who's flying the plane, yeah. who's riding the plane with us. Yeah. Anybody want to take a guess on who these guys might be? Who are these guys? Well, they are actually our developers. You know, I have a feeling that we have a lot of developers here, Tim. Um, so we don't have anything against developers. They keep us on our toes. Uh, they're big proponents of the environment. But every time there is a slight turbulence in the air, they start looking for life vests. You know, they are ready to, uh, they, they start kicking and screaming. And they go into crash positions. So Tim, what have we, if I, if I may maybe what kind of oxygen masks have we given them to make them comfortable in the environment? Right, so it's important for, for not only our developers not to go in crash position, but we're sort of in crash position too. So we want to talk to you some, about some of the tools um, and automation that we've, we've uh, leveraged to make this more of a, a, an easy experience for our developers, uh, make it easier for us to support as well. Absolutely. So the first thing we want to talk to you about is monitoring. So I think there's been some other talks about monitoring, and we have our own implementation as well. But it was the first problem that we had to solve. We needed visibility into Cloud Foundry. We can't be, keep on running Bosch VMs all the time to see how things are, are operating. You can't keep on going into Ops Manager. 
So our, our monitoring solution leverages Nagios um, at the center. So we have Nagios that has a JMX plugin that is pulling metrics out of OpsMetrics. So OpsMetrics um, uh, publishes all sorts of metrics uh, that are low level at the operating system level for CPU, memory, disk, all those kinds of things. <clears throat> and also more higher level things that have to do with Cloud Foundry, like how many re requests you're getting per second into your router layer, um, uh, how many stagers you have available on your DEA layer. So we take all those metrics, we pull them into Nagios, we set some thresholds. When those thresholds are met, we can send alerts out to our operations team. But we can also take those metrics, pull performance data off of them, and forward those off to our, our dashboards, which use Influx database. So Influx is a tool that is built as a data store for time series metrics. And it's really good at pulling in thousands and thousands of metrics and uh, being able to query them very quickly. And we use Grafana to pull those metrics out and create dashboards. So looking at this system, what we end up with is some pretty cool looking Grafana dashboards. And this is the one that we look at every day. Even and they want to see it. What's <laughs> yeah, he wants to look. Um, so uh, this is what we look at every day, and it gives us a really good quick visual indicator on what's going wrong with the system. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these real quick. So if we look at the top right, we have the requests coming in per second into our router layer. Uh, and this, this metric is available through Ops Metrics, and we can publish it through Grafana. So here you can get a, an indication of how busy your system is. If you see rapid drops in this, in this metric, you can get a quick visual indicator that maybe something's wrong with your load balancer layer. If you have a rapid spike, you, you're gonna have, you may have issues with response time. You may, have, you may tell that something is very busy or something's kind of running away. So easy, easy, quick indicator. On the top left, we have what we consider as our user experience graph. So this is response time for all of the endpoints that our customers see. So you have the, the console response time, you have the API response time, you have application response time. So if you start seeing things like this, you call Neville sometimes, no. Um, we, he, usually, he usually thinks it's me who did it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, so this, is, this is telling us that uh, our dev console is actually spiking in response time um, uh, over, over the last, uh, uh, over, over the last few days. So we, we have to definitely take, take action and figure out what's going on with this and um, uh, try to bring the dev console back for our end users. So the, the next, uh, if you go further down, you can see uh, more metrics having to do with HA proxy. Uh, you have some, some system level metrics for our router layer. And if further down, we have DEAs, uh, metrics having to do with our DEAs, which is, which is important looking at DEAs. Sometimes we see spikes in our DEAs, like a single DEA you'll see spiking. And then you'll get an after application developer coming back to us saying, I'm having terrible performance. And you can say, well, it looks like your application is running a single instance because it's only spiking on a single DEA um, or Diego Cell or whatever you're running. Those are great conversations to have. Over a period of time, what we have seen is it's easier to discuss that with your application owners because they get more familiar with the environment and understand how to use the environment. Right, right. So this is not only providing visibility for us, but you know, we can send these off to our application developers and, and have them see, and then that gives them a little bit more assurance that if their application's not performing adequately, and they can look at our, our graphs and see that you know, we're, we're, we're fine. Everything looks good on our side. So it, it allows them to troubleshoot the, in the right direction. So it, it helps us to do uh, online troubleshooting. But what happens when um, you do a, a bad push, or Neville does a bad push, and somehow <laughs> you, delete all of, you delete several jobs, or uh, something goes wrong? Yep, absolutely. And that's why you need backups. When we started having our first uh, few deployments of Cloud Foundry, we started experimenting with the environment and kept bringing it down. So we decided, let's do backups. We used Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and uh, God bless the soul who wrote that six-page uh, mm. document about how to perform backups. 
So we had to sit in front of a screen, you know, fingers on the keyboard, try to execute all these state statements, interpret what they mean, and hours later, you would have a successful backup. During this, this whole time, your application owners are sitting on their hands because they cannot deploy new releases. Cloud Controller goes into a read-only state when backups happen. Luckily for us, uh, we found CFOps. CFOps is an open source tool that helps with automating the backup of the system of a Cloud Foundry deployment. We decided to take it to the next level. Today, when a backup kicks off in our environment, we update our environmental status pages, we update our channels to notify users that a, a backup has been kicked off. We also take metrics out of that. How long did it take for a backup to complete within every environment? That data helps us as well as the developers. It helps us because if for the last 10 weeks, if something was happening, a backup was completing in an hour, and today it took five hours, it's an indicator that we need to go and check out what's wrong. It, it helps our developers because now they have visibility as to when backups are happening so that they can make sure their deployment cycles do not fall during the uh, backup period that we have. Spoke about monitoring and we uh, spoke about backups. But in between two of these, there's also the need to prove the resiliency of the environment. How do you know Cloud Foundry is working like it's supposed to work? You don't want to wait till the power goes off to find out that the generator is not working. You want that generator to do those tests you know, every day and make sure it's ready when the, when the time comes, when you lose power. We try to do something similar in our environment for Cloud Foundry. We have uh, Chaos Lemur. Chaos Lemur is also an open source tool that helps us destroy components within uh, Cloud Foundry. Destruction is not really a good thing, but what you would expect to happen, what you would expect Cloud Foundry to do at that point is make sure that the VM resurrector is bringing the components that have gone down back up, back up and brings the environment into a stable state. It also helps us with enforcing cloud-ready architectures. So when a component within Cloud Foundry gets destroyed, if your application owners, if your developers are breathing you know, down your neck saying, what is going on? You just lost something. I, my application is totally um, unresponsive. That is the time to have a great conversation with them. You want to talk to them about why their application is so much dependent on the infrastructure. Can we um, build more resiliency into that application layer? Can you be multi-site? You know, uh, are there architectural decisions that you had in a previous legacy system that you ported over and simply doesn't work in the environment when instances go down? These are great conversations. Just get them to stop screaming first. I know. <laughs> and, and it's become easier. Like I said before, it's become easier over a period of time um, <clears throat> to have these conversations with them because they are new to the architecture and it takes a while before they get to understand how best to operate their applications in this environment. What we have also seen is this destruction also helps in cleansing. Um, we have seen memory leaks in certain components. We have also seen um, some funky stuff happening within the environment. Usually I blame Tim on it. But this process of destroying and recreating all these VMs or, or certain components brings all of them to, back to a pristine state. And this happens often enough that we start to see those, those funky state things less and less. In addition to all of this, it's great to have a, a Jedi master amongst ourselves. And uh, for us, that is Sergey. He's right here with us. Sergey, hands up. Right. Um, <laughs> Sergey is a great addition to our team. Uh, he works, he brings a wealth of knowledge, not only on the infrastructure side, but also the application side. He's a great liaison between uh, the application teams who are just coming on board and the infrastructure side where he's provided you know, some great services that he has written by himself. Tim, what have we and Sergey together uh, done to help our lives and our application owners' lives? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's good to have that visibility, have that understanding um, into the, the lives of the developer. So Sergey's helped us develop some custom tools that we'll talk to you about. Um, and uh, the first thing that uh, we had to figure out is you know, when your developers are moving into a platform like this, they lose a lot of visibility. They lose a lot of freedom to log on, 
do some trace routes, do some connectivity testing, and get them through. So without that capability, Nev and I had to be on phone calls all the time doing netcat, doing trace routes, making sure that connectivity outbound from Cloud Foundry was there. I, so, don't, I don't miss those calls, by the way. Yeah, in the middle of the either. night, you know, people will wake you up to do trace routes and things. I miss this conference calls. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Sergey developed uh, some connectivity testing tools. We call it Is Connected. So users can go onto Cloud Foundry, and they can put their endpoints into the URL, and it tests connectivity outbound from Cloud Foundry. So it's a really quick and easy way for uh, them to go and see if they have connecti connectivity to GitHub or any external resources that their application needs prior to going live or you know, as the, it's part of their development cycle. And it saves us from being able to have to run stuff manually and allows for the platform to be more self-sustaining. Um, so TCP outbound, traceroute outbound uh, really helps out. So. Uh, another, another useful tool is Apps Metrics dashboards. So we have, if you're just getting started with Cloud Foundry and you just want to have quick time series data to show how your application is performing, we have quick dashboards that they can see uh, similar to the ones that you saw before, where they can go in and look at Apps Metrics and, and get a good indication before having to invest time into building their own tool or, or using some other tools that require a little bit more bootstrap time. Another, another thing that uh, Sergey has definitely helped us out with, um, and if you want to talk to him about any of these things, he'll, he'll be available for questions afterwards, right? right? <laughs> okay. All right, we didn't talk about that beforehand, but he's good. Um, so we have custom service brokers as well. So he has a, a really good system of, of leveraging Docker to be able to create service brokers on the fly that are sort, you know, single tenant pretty much. You, know, you have a Docker container that contains a, an, an entire Elk stack for you. So when you instantiate a service instance, it's going off and creating that service instance for you using some, some pretty cool technology for, uh, behind the scenes. So this has given us a really, good, uh, a really good method for creating custom service brokers that allow people to do all sorts of things like create ELK stacks, create, idea, create proxy servers that allow them to have outbound access into the internet if it's in a protected network. So there's all sorts of, uh, of ways, and it's very extensible. So I encourage you to ask questions if you have them uh, after the talk. Yeah, these are great tools. What you will find is over a period of time, once people get used to having everything within the PaaS environment, they don't want to go out and build their own infrastructure as a service anymore. So the more services you can build into the platform and keep them there, you know, they're very happy with, with getting away from that infrastructure as a service layer that they were in before. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. And outside of the developer, uh, for, our, for our part, we've, we've done a lot of scripting uh, to help automate some of the things that we do every day as well, uh, and our operations team does every, every day. So if you're familiar with Cloud Foundry, you're familiar with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, it's, it's, sometimes it can be a challenge to do user intake because there's a dance of you know, logging on the first time and then being added to an org, and then they can log on, and, and it allows that then they have the access they need. So we, we have scripts that do user intake that pre-create users, pre-add pre them to organizations so the first time they log on, their, their environment's ready for them. And as you know, we, we have a lot of sites, as you could see, so we ha a lot of our users need to clone their environment from one to another, so there's some scripts out there that we do that allow that, org that cloning to happen so their environment and their spaces all look the same between two different sites, which has yeah. been really cool for us. Yeah. But Tim, this is all tech talk, right? I mean, we are engineers and we love technology. And we could talk about technology all day, but there's this thing called social interactions that we are not really good at. And um, you know, even on Facebook, I mean, I, I see your selfies, man. You need some improvement. <laughs> uh, so, over in our in our Cloud Foundry environment, we have worked on the social interaction with our customers. Um, you know, that's where transparency comes in. All the metrics that we saw initially at the start of this, um, this talk is exposed to our customers. So when they have an application problem, they not only look at their application data, but they also have access to all the platform metrics that we see. So we are very transparent. We don't have anything to hide. And when there is actually a problem, we try to address it as openly as possible. I would like to give an example of what happened. It was about six months ago. Um, there were, it was a perfect storm. We had Two things happen. One, 
we decided we're going to help our customers by providing more build packs in the environment. The second was we decided, for whatever reason, monitoring of ephemeral disks was not a big deal. Right? When was the last time ephemeral disks brought down the environment? No, I, yeah. I, I don't even remember that. But so the new build packs started caching on the DEAs, and we pretty much ran out of disk space on all our DEAs. We have a lot of DEAs, just to give you the context. Um, so applications came pretty much to a standstill in that particular Cloud Foundation um, environment that we had. So application owners had to move some of their traffic out of that foundation into other foundations that we have uh, across different data centers. Uh, it was not a really good day for us, I would say. Um, but what we did as an RCA for that was have an open forum with our customers and tell them this is exactly what happened. This is what we failed to do. And we also told steps that we have taken to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And, you know, knock on wood, you know, it hasn't happened yet. And we're very glad. What it also gave us is the um, ability to go back and look at what are the other assumptions that we made. Right? We thought ephemeral disks were not okay to be monitored. What were the other things that we made assumption on? So we had that exercise, and we're very happy that it, it's an eye-opener you know, when incidents happen. We have status pages where we inform uh, our user base on what is happening within the environment. And we have Slack channels where we have really close contact with our customers. We have a Slack channel that's about like 275 to 300 people on the Slack channel. What we find um, over the period of time, we have all these new customers who come, you know, who are interested in the environment. Through the grapevine, they actually heard about Cloud Foundry and they come and ask questions. Before we start replying to them, our existing user community is replying to them. They're like, oh, you know, we ran into this problem before. Here is the solution. They, they want to help us out. So today, as we stand here, we are not supporting the environment. Our Slack channels are being manned by our user base. You know, our developers are helping each other out, and there are very few questions that we answer today. Yeah, having that kind of community brings together uh, sort of like this self-sustaining ecosystem of yeah. users that can share information and help each other out, and we, we see that all the time, yeah. so it's been very important to us. It's crowdsourced, you know, and I think that's, that's one of the very, very... Uh, big keys to our success in, in Comcast. Well, I guess that brings us to uh, keys to success. Uh, when we started making this presentation, I told Tim, you know, people shouldn't be going through all these presentations to see, you know, how to succeed in the environment. Let's just give them an abbreviation, right? We all, we all love abbreviations, right? LOL, BRB, LMFAO, not, not the rap artist, right? Um, yeah, RTFM. RTFM, okay. Please. So, <laughs> Um, so I told him, you know, I'll, I'll make an abbreviation. And uh, after days and days of searching, I finally got it from word of the day. And so today, you guys have ECLA. What does it mean? It means uh, to achieve brilliant success in something. Um, so how, do, how can you replicate you know, some of the success that we have had in our environment? So we start with E, energize your base. Me and Tim have had the, the benefit of just walking into a room and starting to talk about platform as a service and don't have people stare at you like you just told them ECLA. Right? So you want to talk and communicate to your base about what Cloud Foundry is, what are the benefits. Talk, talk about it up and down your stack, you know, to the people, upper management, to the, to the developers. The more educated they are, the more interest they will have in how the technology can help their application, their KPI indicators. If they have apps, applications going down because of legacy technology, how can they scale quickly? How can they take more load you know, with very little notice? C, change the way you think. When I started this, I was an infrastructure as a service engineer. Greg put me on a two-day POC uh, with all the developers. And all I was sitting there and I was thinking, uh, where is the infrastructure piece? It took about one hour to explain um, how to set up the infrastructure. Today, I, we talk, about, talk with our developers all the time. We speak about build packs, logging, um, load balancing, how to do connectivity across different zones. So it's definitely, you know, you have to change the way you think if you are coming from, you know, a, an infrastructure as an engineer role or even from legacy roles. L, live it. Some people might call it eating your own dog food. But today, we have our own cloud portals running within Cloud Foundry. 
showing this kind of belief in our environment and us running very important portals that customers consume within the environment gives them the feeling that yes, we can invest in this environment. We are, we had, they, it gives them the, um, it gives them the um, ability to believe that their applications would wait, work very well in this environment too. A, automation, automation. Like Tim said, there are gonna be tons of people interested. Once you start ramping up, you, there's tons of work that you will have to do. There's gonna be user intake, there are gonna be org creation, coders, there's gonna be um, uh, people who want new services, people who wanna know how to uh, subscribe to services. So, that, so the most important thing is to automate as much as possible so that you don't have to be stuck in the BAU cycle all the time. Right? We could, you can concentrate and put that amount of time into creating new services and trying to keep people within the platform. T, uh, transparency, we just spoke about it. It's very important to listen to your customers. Um, I think it's one of the biggest keys to our success. And what we have done is, like I said, the more transparent you are, they would be doing the work for you, like just as how we are right here, and they are doing the work for us within our channels today. Well. I guess that's Eclat for you. That's a new abbreviation. Tim, what do yes, you think? Yeah. I, I overachieved? Yeah, not too bad. Hashtag Eclat. <laughs> right. um, so, uh, so if you guys are, if you guys are interested in what we're doing, um, uh, obviously, thank you for coming and, and listening to our talk. Um, if you're interested, we have, we have openings. <laughs> uh, so come talk to us or, or go visit that site. Uh, quick shout out to uh, Nick, who has a talk today as well at 2:10 p.m. in this room. So please, uh, please see how uh, our journey has continued into, their, uh, into our developers' worlds and see how they've uh, changed the way they do business. So with that, if anyone has any questions. Time for you guys. Question mark. Yeah. Oh, there's a mic right there in case you guys have any questions. So they don't step up and repeat the question. Okay. okay. Got Absolutely. It. Okay. All right. Well, well thank you. Well, thank you, guys. If you have any questions, you have to hurry.